long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> long ago, I'd say maybe in a century that's far, far away from us, there was a man who was traveling from a long distance just to get to a place where he wanted to worship God. He traveled through all different sorts of areas, all different sorts of towns and cities and regions, and even through deserts, just to get to the place where he's going to worship. Well, he arrived there safely. And he was able to worship God. And on his way back home, having to travel all the way back from where he was from, going through all those regions, terrains, I mean, whatever he was going through, whatever, all the different areas, the deserts, the cities, those towns, he wanted to kill some time, so while he was killing time, he decided to just go ahead and start reading, reading his Bible, specifically the Old Testament. And as he was reading, he was struggling and trying to understand what was being said. And sure enough, as he was pondering and really seeking the truth on what the text was trying to say, here comes a preacher of God. He comes to him and asks him, hey... What is it that you're reading, huh? Do you understand it? He starts struggling. He starts saying, Oh, I'm having a hard time. I'm trying to figure out what this prophet here in the Old Testament is saying. I mean, is the prophet talking about himself or somebody else? Well, what text are you reading? And sure enough, they were reading the following words. And he was oppressed and afflicted. Like a lamb led to the slaughters, he did not open his mouth. Or like a sheep, before its shears remained silent. And so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. It is from this passage right here that this man decided to preach to him Jesus the Christ. If you're familiar with that story that I shared, you can bet that it is a non-fictional story. It is an account that actually happened in Acts chapter 8 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Do you understand what it is that you read? How can I unless someone teaches me? I mean, is the prophet talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? Isaiah 53 was the passage that he was reading from the Old Testament. And the text specifically says in Acts chapter 8 verse 35 that with this passage... Philip preached Jesus the Christ to him. How is it that an Old Testament prophet, such as Isaiah, 800 years before the coming of Jesus, and even before his death, could have been writing about Jesus and his death? Well, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, God says, Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Much of this promised comfort that Isaiah tells us would come through the ministry of this perfect servant that is being discussed here in Isaiah 53. This perfect servant of the Lord who would do everything that Israel had failed to do. And while doing those things, also bringing restoration for her. The servants in Isaiah 53 is the principal figure in at least four texts of Isaiah, which are often called the servant songs. It begins in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 through 4. Chapter 49, verse 1 through 13. Chapter 50, verse 4 through 11. And chapter 52, verse 13 through chapter 53, verse 12. The last of which was being spoken between Philip and the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. In particular, Isaiah 53 depicts the tragedy of the servant. Although sent by God, he was utterly despised and rejected by his own people, Isaiah tells us. All of this, according to the prophet of Isaiah, 
in some way fit into the overall plan and working of God to bring salvation for all mankind. The New Testament writers, through inspiration, understood Isaiah 53 as referring to Jesus and his sufferings, even though it was written long before his coming. When Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law in Matthew chapter 8, verse 8, uh, 14 through 17, we read that this was to fulfill what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. He healed our infirmities, and he took away our diseases. Isaiah 53, verse 4. As well, the Gospel of John quoted Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, referring to the Jews who would not believe in the signs that were being portrayed or being done by Jesus himself. Quoting 53, verse 1, who will believe our report? Or who has believed our report? John chapter 12, verse 36 through 41. So it is here, Isaiah chapter 53, that is the key text because it shows how clearly the Old Testament prophets spoke concerning Jesus and his coming. And I'd like for us for today, and as well, if the Lord wills, next Sunday morning, to focus on Isaiah 53 about God's perfect servant. Who was God's perfect servant? Well, that is fulfilled and answered for us in the New Testament regarding of who that perfect suffering servant that is spoken of four times in the book of Isaiah. Jesus is the perfect servant of God. Jesus is the perfect servant of God. And from Isaiah 52... Verse 13 through chapter 53, verse 12. There's four specific descriptions that Isaiah talks about regarding this perfect suffering servant of God. He begins by stating in chapter 52, verse 13 through 15, about his success. Number one, he begins about his success. So if you have your Bibles already open there to Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 15, Isaiah says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. So this perfect servant of God, when he makes his appearance, his appearance is going to be successful. Why? Because he is going to be greatly exalted, he says. Verse 13 through 15 in regards to his success, he is successful. Why? Because he is going to be greatly exalted, he says. And I want you to remember, Isaiah had already spoken about this servant of God three times earlier. So this is the fourth and final servant song that Isaiah now brings to a close. And so here in verse 13 through 15, in regards to his uh, greatly um, exalted success, he gives four particular things about him. And what's interesting is that in these four, they seem to be pairs. So the first two are somewhat paired together, and the last two are paired together. Notice what he says. He says that first he shall act wisely. Other verses may say prosper. Well, the Hebrew word here literally means effective wisdom. Therefore, he is going to be successful. He is going to prosper. Why? Because of his effective wisdom. He's going to have great wisdom beyond just about any human understanding. 
He's not just going to have some type of wisdom that an old man with a beard, with the ho holding a stick or, or a cane, is going to share with other people. No, this type of wisdom is somewhat going to be extraordinary, somewhat going to be phenomenal. It's going to be wisdom from above. Interesting. Of course, at this time, they probably didn't know what that meant. But sooner or later for us, thankfully, as the New Testament has been given to us, it reveals that, yes, when Jesus came, that effective wisdom that he brought was not human wisdom. It was wisdom from above. So, yes, he will prosper because of his effective wisdom. Then he says that he shall be high and lifted up. Dignity and honor will be bestowed upon the servant. So when you put those pairs together, he's going to be dignified. He's going to be honored. He's going to be lifted up because of his great effective wisdom that he is going to share among the people around him. That's pair number one. The second pair, he begins by saying that in regards of his appearance, he says, verse 14, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. Now, what's interesting is that in regards of his appearance being so marred beyond human semblance, it's the fact that he's going to come with power. Okay, keep that in mind. Because in the Jewish mindset, the coming of the Messiah was thought to be one who would come with power, but not the kind of power that they were thinking. The kind of power that they were thinking was what? The military type of power. He's going to come. His appearance is going to be with like shiny golden armor. And he's going to have physical power that's going to destroy all the physical nations around them. Well, yeah, he's going to come with power, but not the type of power that they're thinking of. It says that he shall sprinkle many nations. That is, he is going to be here to serve. That sprinkling of what the text says. Other versions may say start, but the text of sprinkling is the idea in the Hebrew sense that refers back to the sprinkling of the Day of Atonement on the mercy seat. It's the sprinkling of the blood, that is, specifically, on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. So, what kind of power is he going to come with? He's going to come, a, come with a power that is going to sprinkle all the nations. Folks, what did Jesus do for us? What did he do for us? Keep that question in mind. We'll answer that. Of course, you probably already know the answer to that rhetorical question, but we're going to come back to it here in just a few moments. But it is his humble service, not a military type of power, but in his humble service that would lead him to be greatly exalted. Kings, he says, would shut their mouths in astonishment as they came to understand what was taking place. So the power that he brought of the sprinkling of all the many nations, like that of the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. What's all happening here? The power he's going to come is the power that he's going to bring of salvation, redemption, atonement for sins for all of the nations, Jews and Gentiles. Kings would shut their mouths as they look at astonishment of what is actually happening. Salvation, atonement, redemption, forgiveness of sins. The fulfillment of this prophecy was to come through God's perfect servant, the Messiah, whose name was Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. 800 years later, it's no wonder that the Apostle Paul would quote Isaiah 53, verse 15, when he wrote to the Romans, saying that it is my ambition to preach the good news, the gospel, not to places where Jesus has already been named, as it is written, those who have never heard, or who have been told of him, will see. And those who have never heard will understand. Romans chapter 15, verse 20 and 21. 
Paul finally understood what was being said concerning Isaiah 53, verse 15. It was his ambition to know exactly what was going on with Isaiah 53. It was his ambition to know that Jesus was the one who fulfilled Isaiah 52 and 53 to the point that he wanted to go across and go to places that had never heard of this good news, of this wonderful astonishment of, the, of who this suffering servant is, of the perfect servant of God, that he was eager to go to places that had never heard of him. Why? Because so that they will finally see and finally understand after hearing of what Jesus had done and who he was. Folks, Jesus is God's perfect servant because of his wonderful success. And in his success, he was greatly exalted. He came with a purpose, he came with a plan, and he did that very thing. That is why it's called good news. That is why we're called to go into the entire world, north, south, east, west. When he rearranged those letters, it spells out news. What news? The good news of Jesus Christ that we're to take to all the world. And there are some, even today, in this community that may have heard about Jesus, but who really don't understand him at all. We are called to go to those people and to share him, share with them about that great news, about the wonderful success, about who Jesus is, and how he was greatly exalted, and what he did for all the nations, and specifically what he did for you. We are called, just as Paul, to do just that. He had an ambition for it, folks, and let us have that same ambition. Number two, Jesus is God's perfect servant. Because of, number one, his success, and number two, because of his suffering. Jesus is God's perfect servant because of his suffering. So we transition to chapter 53, verse 1 through 6. Isaiah the prophet continues on, writing, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. How was Jesus God's perfect servant? Well, even though that he came greatly exalted with effective wisdom to fulfill the plan that was laid out from the very beginning to bring salvation to all of mankind, he had to go through a lot of suffering for that. He was God's perfect servant because of his suffering. What kind of suffering did he face? Well, first off, he was rejected. He was rejected, verse 1 through 3. Verse 1, he asks the question, who has believed our report? Who has believed what, has, uh, uh, what he has heard from us? Well, that's a rhetorical question with an obvious answer. Not many. Not many. In Romans chapter 10, verse 16, Paul quoted the same verse in pointing out uh, that only a minority of his Jewish brethren, his Jewish hearers, were willing to believe the message he had preached to them about Jesus. Isaiah says that the reason why he was rejected is because he didn't fit the way that the Jewish people had in mind. How so? 
Well, because he grew up before them like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. What does he mean by that? He's just like an av average plant, like an ordinary plant. There's nothing spectacular about how he looked. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. Now, a lot of people here in verse 2 often interpret this meaning that Jesus did not have a pleasing physical appearance. Well, it could be, but it seems to be more likely pointing out that his uh, companions tended to judge him superficially. What I mean by that is that they saw nothing special about him. He came to them, not in a bright, shiny, bronze armor with a horse ready to destroy a whole bunch of nations. No, he was just like an average Jew, an ordinary Jew, dark-skinned, maybe not so tall, not so short. He's just about right there. I mean, his he may have had a beard, maybe probably just like a clean-shaven type of beard. I mean, he may have had... Not so long hair, a bunch of curly hair. I mean, he just looked like an ordinary Jew. Just like there's an ordinary plant, he just looked like an ordinary average Jew. Well, it's interesting because John the Baptizer, in John chapter 1, verse 31, when he first encountered Jesus in a crowd, he could not pick him out from among the crowd because he just looked like your average, ordinary Jew. He didn't come with the shiny bronze armor, with the big, awesome horse, with the long sword ready to uh, seek vengeance and to destroy all nations. No. He came as a very humble servant. Folks, this is exactly what the New Testament reveals to have been true of Jesus. Verse 3 says that because... They didn't fit his description of the Messiah and of what he looked like. He was despised and rejected by men, by his own people. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteem him not. He was rejected by the majority of the Jewish people to whom he came as Messiah. What he does does not depend on his popularity. In fact, what he does tends to really frustrate the religious leaders at that time. Folks, this rejection is still here today. A lot of people reject Jesus today because he doesn't fit the way that they want him to be. Just as in his own time, Jesus, the perfect suffering servant, does not appeal to self-centered self-serving, self-maximizing mentality that prevails in our world today. So he's rejected by the vast majority of the people. I find it interesting that if he were to come to earth as a powerful ruler, a wealthy businessman, a skilled athlete, or even a top famous celebrity in Hollywood, no doubt he would draw a larger following. But still, the perfect suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is no more popular today than he was 2,000 years ago. And that still type of rejection that we see today is because of that same type of viewpoint. Jesus doesn't fit the way that I want him to look. He sounds boring. Oh, I can't go out to party and do all this stuff. Oh, I can't do the things that I'm wanting to do. He doesn't sound very fun to me, so I don't want him around. I don't want anything to do with him. We think that type of rejection only happened 2,000 years ago. No, folks, that type of rejection is still here today. And it's sad. It is very sad. So yes, he was, his suffering involved being rejected. And also his suffering involved being mistreated. Physically, mentally, emotionally, you name it. He was mistreated. Verse 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. To summarize, verse 4 through 6 just emphasizes that the sufferings of the servant were on behalf of others, including the prophet himself. Now, from verse 4 through 6, the careful reader will observe how many times the words we, us, and our are used. They occur ten times in just these three verses. Verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6. We, us, and our all occur ten times. Many refer to this aspect of Jesus' suffering as the vicarious or a substitutionary atonement, which basically means that he bore our punishment for us when he didn't have to. When we deserved it all, he took it upon himself to lay it on himself so that we wouldn't have to suffer that punishment. In his suffering and death on the cross, he was experiencing on our behalf what we truly deserve. And folks, this is what the New Testament says. The cross of Jesus was all about his death on behalf of the sins of the world. Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, that for he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross or on the tree, he says, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. There's also another passage in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Some of you all may be familiar with this, who's been joining for our studies on Wednesday nights through the epistles of John. Where John says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is the propitiation, the satisfaction of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Paul also writes, really in the whole context, of Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 9, but there he says that while we are still helpless, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. And it's by this that God demonstrated his own love toward us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the part of the gospel message that should appeal to our hearts. The truth that Jesus Christ suffered and died for us. It gets me thinking that every time around this season, Christmas is coming up. And we often hear that motto, Jesus is the reason for the season. Well, Jesus is the reason for every season, not just this particular one. And we're about to see many people who are going to honor about the baby Jesus, about the coming of Jesus. Well, folks, yes, Isaiah talked about his coming and what he, his purpose is to do, his success, his uh, greatly uh, being exalted. He talks about that, yes. But if it's all just focused on that, then you miss the whole point. What's the whole point about to suffer and die for the sins of you and I. That was the purpose. And that is what made him to be the perfect servant of God that is portrayed right here through Isaiah. Again, he talked about it four times. And here he brings it to a close from 52 and 53. <clears throat> to see this point even more clearly, it is helpful to personalize Isaiah 53 by rewording it in the first person singular. For example, Surely he has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows. Yet I esteemed him not. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought me peace. With his stripes I am healed. Like myself, like a sheep that has gone astray, 
I have turned to my own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of mine. To kind of give a little bit of a preacher's confession to one of this is actually what I reflect on on occasions when we're going through the Lord's Supper. This is what's going through my head. This is what's going through my heart. When I think about what it is that he had done for me. What it is that he's done, not just for me, but for you as well. And this has been honestly a great exercise for me to kind of personalize Isaiah into the first singular. And I encourage all to do the same as well. It'll help you understand a little bit better. The Ethiopian's question after reading Isaiah 53 was a good one. Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? From the New Testament, we know the answer. Jesus, the one who suffered and died for us all. So as we bring part one of this to a close, obviously we understand it is Jesus who is the perfect servant of God. And Isaiah discussed about his success, his coming, and he talked about his sufferings. Next uh, Sunday, Lord willing, I'd like to look at the last two points that he brings us from Isaiah 53. But folks, as you personalize Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 6, have you accepted who Jesus really is? Do you believe what the prophet spoke about come to pass? Do you believe that it is Jesus who is that perfect servant of God? who laid upon himself the sins that you have committed in order for you to be saved, to be redeemed, to be atoned for your sins, to be saved and to be forgiven. Have you made him your Lord, Master, and Ruler of your life by repenting of your sins, turning away from that old way of life, having a change of life, a change of attitude, a change of direction, have you confessed him as that Lord, Master, and Ruler of your life? And have you been baptized to have your sins washed away? Most of us in here that I'm very familiar with have obeyed the gospel. But I'm sure that there are many who are watching this right now or who may be watching in the future on the YouTube channel who may have not obeyed that gospel plan of salvation. Well, as time is still ticking, you may do so right now. Do not wait. But if you're here this morning who is a child of God, and is needing prayers of forgiveness of sins, prayers of comfort or encouragement or for strength, by all means, the church is here to be able to pray for your behalf. If you have any need whatsoever, please come forward together as we stand and as we sing. All things ready, come to the feast, come for the day will now be.